Look, most people, when I say the words hafnium, say gesundheit. And uh, really, it's not quite as bad as that. It's actually a very interesting metal when you get into it. And I think I, I won't, be, won't be sort of embarrassing you or insulting you by saying probably 99.99% of you have never heard of it before. And I probably hadn't until starting on this project many, many years ago. Um, but what I'm going to try and do today is give you a very brief overview of the, of the metal and where its, where its applications are. And then just finish up by showing how it fits into our Dubbo project, which is, a, as Tracy said, one of the world's most advanced polymetallic projects uh, that will produce zirconium, hafnium, niobium, yttrium, and the complete rare earth suite. So it's a very interesting project. So just background. I'm not going to dwell on this, go through this. Uh, it's a, the name was derived from the Latin name of, uh, for Copenhagen. I think that's very valuable information. Uh, it's a very dense metal. Um, the key things there, high thermal neutron absorption, high stability and strength into temperature. That's thermoelectric, high dielectric, and you'll see where this goes in a moment, going down that path of applications for the metal. Current traded as crystal bar, hafnium oxide, and then hafnium tetrachloride. In the middle, you can actually see a hafnium oxide product that we produced off our pilot plant. It'll make more sense further on when you see the flow sheet. So where does hafnium come from? Well, basically, hafnium and zircon zirconium go hand in hand. They're, they're chemically almost identical, and in nature, they basically occur together. Most hafnium is located within zircon. That's about 1 to 50, 50 to 1 ratio, zirconium to hafnium. And hence, the manufacture of hafnium, or the recovery of hafnium, really depends on what happens to zircon and the processing of the zircon. And if you look at the zirconium industry on the right-hand side in that little triangle, that pyramid, you can see it goes through a suite of different zirconium chemicals and you end up at zirconium metal. Now zirconium metal is used in nuclear reactors, it's the metal the tubing that holds the, uh, the nuclear fuel in place and the reason it's used is because it has a high temperature resistance uh, but is uh, porous to, to neutrons. Hafnium on the other hand um, is a complete opposite to that, while it has high temperature resistance it absorbs neutrons so it gets used in the control rods in a reactor. But the reason I'm talking about this is because zirconium, to refine it to nuclear grade, you have to get the hafnium out. As, you, as I said, you can see how having it in there would, uh, would damage the structure of the, of the tubing. So about 1,000 tonnes of zirconium metal produces about 50 tonnes or 60 tonnes of hafnium. Oops. The, the process of recovering hafnium, therefore, is part of recovering zirconium metal and it's very complex. It's a carbochlorination process, uh, vapor, chemical vapour uh, deposition, which basically recovers the zirconium, and then the hafnium comes out and goes down through another flow sheet, a very similar flow sheet, to produce, again, what we call nuclear-grade hafnium. And there are many opportunities down that path to take off both the zirconium or the hafnium uh, for other uses and other applications. So the current demand? And again, surprisingly, uh, super alloys are the big, big driver for hafnium, have been for the last 10 or so years. Uh, regardless, most people relate to the nuclear industry, but really hafnium is used in super alloys, and I'll show you a bit more about that in a moment, and various other applications that I'll try and give an overview. But the principle of 67 tonnes a year is the current known demand, and as I'll try and demonstrate, uh, the demand is really limited by supply. You know, our feeling out in the marketplace, talking to, to end users around the world, is that the, the demand for hafnium would be much greater if there was guaranteed and sustainable supply. So these are just running through the applications. Industrial gas turbines. In other words, the, the high temperature part of a, of a gas turbine, uh, nickel cobalt alloys are used. If you throw in 1 to 2 per cent hafnium into that, you raise its operating temperature from 1400 degrees to 2000 degrees centigrade. So it has fuel efficiencies, emissions minimisation and just general uh, overall better operability. The same applies to jet engines, same, same principle, same process, although I should add that the bigger, the bigger use of hafnium is in industrial gas turbines. Then to rocket nozzles. Um, the, uh, the SpaceX Falcon 9 uh, uses about a, a, a niobium hafnium alloy. It's an 80 to 10, 80 to 20 per cent niobium to hafnium, or 90 to 10 per cent, depending who you talk to. And people like SpaceX and all the other different new, new generation uh, space companies are looking at these and much bigger demand for that kind of alloy going forward uh, in rocket nozzles. 
plasma arc cutting tools, hafnium oxide. Uh, catalyst for making things like uh, plastics, um, PVCs and those sort of things. Again, I'm not going to go into the technical details of those because first of all I'm incapable of doing that and secondly I don't have time, fortunately. Uh, nuclear industry, I've already talked about the applications in the nuclear industry. Um, not, a, not a big driver currently, as you'd appreciate. The nuclear industry has gone a little bit flat in the last sort of 10 or so years. Uh, but certainly places like China, huge building uh, effort going on into the nuclear industry at present. You know, 100, 170 planned nuclear reactors in the next sort of 20 odd years or 30 years. And then to next generation. Some of the interesting things about, about hafnium oxide and hafnium is its ability to act as a dielectric, which then can be used for memory storage, for computer chips, and we're already seeing it creeping into the industry. I was probably asked 10 years ago um, by a fund manager in New York, do we have any hafnium? And I said, well, yes, but why? Uh, and he said, well, I think it's going to, going to impact on the, on the IT industry in the next, sort of next decade or so. We was probably a bit out in his timing. Uh, but we're now starting to see fairly dramatic changes, fairly dramatic interest in developing these sides of the business. And you won't be able to read that, but really it's, what it's saying up there is this new um, ferroelectric cap capacity of hafnium oxide does make it ideal for memory storage. Uh, they can do amazing things. They can do atomic layer deposition. You can put it in molecular, molecular thicknesses which means both your storage systems, your processing systems become smaller, lighter, less energy required, no heat, all of those sort of things which you can see going forward will be very interesting in the, in the computing industry. Um, the thermoelectric capacity of hafnium oxide, really interesting. It converts heat energy into electricity. So you can use it to, in automobiles, engines, large things. And one of the things we've started to hear about in the last probably only six months is the potential to use it for like solar applications. Can you imagine putting it on the roof of a house, an apartment, you can coat the roofing material with a hafnium oxide, it basically will absorb the heat and, and generate electricity. So you're talking about a, a different kind of solar panel. Now, reality on time, time zone of that, I've got no idea, uh, but certainly some of the people that understand this think it's a, it's a high probability going forward into the future. So the car industry, you know, okay, we are, we're talking about electric cars, we're talking about replacement of the inter, in, um, internal combustion engine, but certainly in the short term, capturing that heat, just the waste heat coming off the exhaust system of a, of a, of a car or truck can be converted into electricity. It may help replace the use of batteries, it may help replace the use of alternators in the, in the vehicle engine. Again, sounds counterintuitive to where we're going down the, the electric car industry, uh, but certainly the big, the big motor manufacturers have been looking at these applications for, for a number of years. Um, the radiative cooling. Uh, basically, you can put uh, hafnium oxide film on glass such that the incoming solar radiation hits the glass, the light penetrates into the inside of the building, but the energy, the heat energy, gets reflected back off that glass, but it goes back at a frequency that doesn't reheat the atmosphere. In other words, you've got the incoming heat, but you're not reflecting energy back into the atmosphere to, to, to reheat it again. And the reverse component of that it can be used for air conditioning inside a building. You can actually absorb the heat out of the building and convert it to electricity and do away with air conditioning, internal air conditioning. These things are in development. There's no commercial application to these, but there are things that we're seeing may come into fruition in the next sort of 10 or so years. I'm sorry, I think you must have finished your lunch, fortunately, but uh, it's, it's um, cancer treatment application. So what happens is that you can insert hafnium oxide nano, nanoparticles inside a tumour. It becomes a focus for x-rays and radiation, and then the hafnium oxide absorbs that radiation, and then it then uh, pumps out radioactivity and radio radioisotopes from inside the tumour. So you're basically killing the tumours from the inside. And this is an application that we have seen. It's starting to be used and starting to become, I won't say common, but certainly uh, the medical fraternity are becoming aware of it. Pricing structure, who knows? I mean, if you think the rare earth industry is opaque, uh, hafnium industry is extremely opaque. 
And one of the reasons for it is such small volumes traded. Uh, there are very few uh, limited suppliers of the material. It gets into strategic applications, so you start talking strategic, you start talking defence, and you find very quickly that nobody really knows in terms of volumes and pricing. But you can see there, it's probably sitting today, hafnium metal at around about $1,100 a kilogram. Hafnium oxide generally is probably about half that price, depending on its quality. So the supply, um, the big supplier is Arriva in France, coming out of its new, zirconium nuclear plant, and then ATI in the US, also out of its nuclear zirconium plant. Uh, Westinghouse was a smaller producer. We're not sure about Westinghouse's future. Uh, but outside of that, you can see some coming out of Russia, some coming out of China. There is an interesting statement there. It says uh, recycling or revert. Um, Nobody can show us where that's coming from. So that mysterious 20 tonnes, or 10 tonnes I think it is, uh, really is not sure if that really is recycling. We don't believe it is recycling. And the total world supply on a yearly basis will fit in that 40 foot sea container. So we're not talking about large volume commodity material. We're talking about something that's very finite, relatively small tonnage, but with the potential to be much greater. So that graph there says the supply is about 70 tonnes. You saw the demand on an earlier slide saying about 67 tonnes. As I said before, we're very convinced that as the supply increases, the demand will also escalate. So there's a, a graph, and the, the, the bottom graph shows some guesstimate, and that's the best way to describe it, of where Hafnium industry is going to go. The top green line, is called the high expectations. I'm sure that if that was analysed again today or in the next sort of six months, that would start to look like being a realistic expectation. But somewhere over the next uh, 10 years, we'll see the demand go from 70 tonnes a year to probably 160 tonnes a year. It may even go greater. And again, I don't want you to get too excited about the volume, but it's interesting in terms of value. It is a high value uh, product of great increasing st strategic and scientific demand. So where does that leave us? Why is Alcane here talking about, about Hafnium? And it basically goes back to our Dubbo project. Uh, it's located in what we call the central west region, the east coast of the state of New South Wales, about 400 kilometres from Sydney. Uh, it's a great place to operate. It's, uh, Dubbo itself is a city of about 45,000 people. It has great infrastructure. It's a major agricultural centre, uh, power, gas, water, engineering, and of course people. And the project's located about 25 kilometres south of the, of the town. It's a very big resource. Our open pit resource is probably 100 years. But a million tonnes a year, we can produce these, these, these metals for almost forever. Um, we talk about a 35-year reserve life, and that's just an interim number to, to, to satisfy the financiers. And again, just to explain why we've gone down the Hafnium path. Probably four years ago, um, an aerospace company came to us and asked that question, what are you doing with your hafnium? And we said, well, it goes with the zirconium product. It just goes out as part of the zirconium products in that ratio, uh, 40 to 1, 50 to 1, that it's in the ore body. And they said, well, we think there's a growing demand. If you guys think you can recover it, then there's, then there's a potential for us to be buyers of that material. So we progressed from there. We've effectively, it, it became an add-on, if you like, and in a moment I'll show you the revenue stream. It's an add-on, uh, and basically in the meantime, we've charged off, we've gone, we're working through the project, and current status is we've run the pilot plant now for eight years, and, and uh, Adrian talked about Anstow, that pilot plant's been located at Anstow, and people often ask me, why eight years? Why is it taking so long? And it's really not taking so long, it's a, fu it's a function of de-risking, optimising the products, because we have quite a complex product suite coming out, we have multiple customers. We don't have one or two or three customers. We've probably got about 40 currently on our books. So you're talking about different products, different quality, um, different particle size, different chemistry, right across the board. So you have to be very strong technically managing each of the material. So going through that, all, our, all of our approvals in place, state and federal, front end engineering and design was done about two years ago. That's leading now into a bankable study, and I'll show why that in a moment. Uh, we've got Udatech, the large Finnish technology engineering company, working with us to provide us with an EPC. 
and SMBC are our financial advisors, and these guys based in Sydney. And I'll show you an interesting development of probably the last 12 months about our modular design and our, and our staged build. First of all, just going back to the flow sheet, it actually, and that's a cartoon of course, obviously, um, it's actually simpler than what it seems. It's a sulfuric acid roast leach process. So basically we take whole of ore, we crush it up, we grind it, we mix it with sulfuric acid, we heat it up, we take that material, we, we wash that with water, and in doing that we get all of the metals that we want are all in solution. Unfortunately, we don't get too many other contaminants, so the solvent extraction stages going forward from that are relatively straightforward. This is not, I hate to use the words, rocket science, uh, but it is a workable and de demonstrable flow sheet that we've now operated for a number of years. And down the right hand side you can see the products. A number of zirconium products, the hafnium product, and just a quick explanation. As I showed before, hafnium recovery from zirconium metal plants is a very complex flow sheet. We actually use standard solvent extraction technology. This is something that we've developed with Anstone. Uh, it works well. We basically are getting probably 80% or 90% of our hafnium recovered at a product quality level presently which we can sell. Further on you can see ferro and in which we, which we make and sell. And then on the rare earths on site, because of lanthanum cerium pricing structure, we'll basically separate those out and leave them. The yttrium we will use probably ourselves to make stabilised yttria uh, zirconia products. And then the main core of the rare earths, the ne praseninium, neodymium, etc., right through to lutetium, uh, go off to our partner in Vietnam for separation and recovery. So I mentioned the modular design. So that flow sheet that I showed you, if we did that at a million tonnes a year, it's about a billion dollar US project. A big project, a high cost project. So trying to re reduce that exposure, reduce that front end risk, we decided to look at a modulus type, type construct and basically we are talking about building it in trains. Now if you know the LNG industry, the LNG industry builds its processing facilities in trains. A big LNG plant might have 10 trains and it's because they do it in stages. We're looking to do uh, train one, train two, up to what we call stage one, which is a half million tonne a year operation, and then train three and train four, which become second stage. And in doing that, we can sort of bring the capital cost down to manageable levels for a company of Alcone size. We can certainly get to those sorts of numbers. And we're talking about 500, 600 million dollar market, uh, sorry, uh, capital cost for stage one. And I won't try and go through and explain it, but you can see that stage one includes some components of that plant, some components of that operation, which are a million tonne a year. So it's already in place to do the full, full capacity. The timing, we should be in production if all goes well in, in 2019, and then the stage two should come on stream sometime 22, 23 after we go forward. Out, output, and again, this is a talk about hafnium, uh, so you can see hafnium is highlighted. Yes, we can produce 200 tonnes a year, or 250 or 300 tonnes a year. Obviously, no point in doing that in a market which is currently 80 tonnes. So our start-up capacity is somewhere around about 25 tonnes to 50 tonnes at full operation. So we've scaled and we'll scale that output to make sure that we don't go in and, and sort of demolish the market. And you can see the other products that I've just listed down there. I won't go into those at this stage. It's worth just showing this. This is our revenue pie chart, if you like. So you can see, this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, it's a polymetallic deposit which gives it a revenue stream, a diverse revenue stream, which is one of our great advantages going forward. We're not driven by you know, two or three magnet rare earths to drive the, to drive the economics of the project. We're not, we're not driven by zirconium, for example. But the hafnium and the niobium are equally important. They're valuable attributes. That hafnium, by the way, the 10 per cent's only in there at about 25 tonnes a year at something like five or six hundred dollars a kilogram, so way below the current metal price. The revenues, stage one revenues, it generates margins of hundred million dollars a year out of that. Once you go to stage two, you're talking about 200, 250 million dollars a year revenue margin. That's a very good project in terms of something that's going to have a total capital cost of around a billion dollars. So. I'm sorry to sort of drift it offline, but the idea was to bring the, bring the Dubbo project into the scheme of things at, uh, at the end. Uh, but you know, we think it's a fascinating project. 15 years of really hard work has gone into it to get to where we are today. 
We are construction ready and we're putting together the financing package right now. Thank you.